adapted for the small screen. <laughs> Dermot the Walsh, the director. Hilary Devin Jones, the producer. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman, of course, who brought Mr. Pepper so memorably uh, to life. <laughs> the rather racy Dame Judy Dench. <laughs> Mr. Silver. And of course, uh, Richard Curtis, who along with Paul helped to adapt it for television. Welcome all of you, please. Take your seats. <coughs> Judy, if you... Yeah. Marvellous. Okay. And Dustin, there you go. And whilst we wrestle with the image of you two jumping stark naked into a lake... <laughs> Which is quite an image. You didn't, you didn't do it, but we were all waiting for the big finish, uh, uh, Judy. Let's start with you, um, uh, Richard. Uh, five years you've been pondering this tale of love in our dotage, if you like. Why so passionate about it? Oh, I mean, lots of reasons. I, I, I did love, I, I wanted to do it because of the Royal Dumb Connection, because I loved it, and I really have. I read those books to a succession of, of, of children. And I think particularly as we started to um, work on it, I, I was particularly um, in love with the idea of doing something about love between uh, vaguely, slightly, <laughs> minusculely <laughs> older people. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 my mum and dad had an incredibly happy <laughs> marriage, so as it were, they, they did what they did in 1952 um, or something like that. I remember, I always forget, what was the name of A Pack of Lies. Mm. I remember seeing Judy in A Pack of Lies, which is the most extraordinary stage performance of a really, really Pretty sweet, sweet wasn't gentle it? housewife. <laughs> um, not the extraordinary, uh, grand and exceptional figure she is. And just thinking that absolutely just is my mum and exactly how she would react to it. The bit when you... Um, uh, it's about the crew, <coughs> it's about the spy. bit that she's in the lift. And she says that she likes summer best, and then spring best, and then autumn best, and then and that again would have been exactly that optimistic spirit of my mum. And then and then, um, thank you very much. My dad was a much shyer, um, uh, you know, immigrant from Australia who was uncertain of his ground and of his accent and everything like that. So I found just a huge amount in my own life which I managed to into it. So oh, I'm sure everyone's agreed it's a charming piece. It makes you smile out loud. We're all lit up. What is different from the book, though, of course, is the narrator. Can I ask you about the, the choice of James Corden? Well, we wanted someone who was very lively and, and sort of chirpy and a bit cheeky in that sense, sense of the way Roald Dahl is, and also a storyteller that would draw us into the story of these two people. And also, uh, it enabled us to sort of, he says that when they get into the lift, he and his daughter at the end, not the ending you were expecting, and it gave us the opportunity to do a sort of tale of the unexpected um, <laughs> Lowell Dahl stories. So that's, and then, and James has a natural sort of, I've seen him in um, One Man, Two Governors, and he has that wonderful way of drawing an audience in, and I, we, we thought that would be marvellous. So. Appeals to um, all yeah. ages. Um, speaking of which, uh, Dame Judy, Dustin Hoffman, uh, Hilary, the choice. First choice? Of course. Oh, I don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely first choice. And uh, I, just a <coughs> dream. I thought Jennifer Lawrence was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is in town. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really was. It was a, well, do you think, dare we ask? And we just thought, what have we got to, what does that mean? Me, I think. Um, what have we got to lose? <coughs> and... My goodness, they both said yes, and I honestly think for all of us it was the best days of our lives. So, yeah, first choice. So, uh, Judy, if I can start with you then, the appeal of the piece for you. And I know you're a bit of a twinkler. Well, I, no, I knew the, knew the story, because, you know, I, I read it to children, many, many children, and so I knew the story, and, <clears throat> well, they did say Dustin Hoffman's name. <laughs> so, I mean, it could have been five on a treasure island or whatever they you know. Five go to smuggle a Five go to smuggle It could have been any of those things. It could have been just, would you like to come and walk down the street and Richard Curtis will watch you and 
<laughs> we'll throw a tape across we'll it. Throw it. Yes, quite. So, but you know, I, I, uh, I, I wanted, to, I wanted to play Mrs. Silver. You know, un, unconditionally. And is it true you got the reputation on the set for being a bit of a tortoise whisperer? A tortoise whisperer. A tortoise whisperer. <laughs> I did get on very, very well mm. with that. My my family said to me, because we have a lot of animals, they said, oh, you're going to come home with a tortoise. I said, no, I won't come home with a tortoise. Because a, tor a tortoise, you know, won't run towards you with that kind of smiling, <laughs> fuzzy <laughs> face, you know, like the cats do and the dogs do. But, um, but I did get quite fond of it, of a li little tortoise called Alfie. And my character's too stupid to know it's being changed. <laughs> <laughs> it was Alfie. But it did go into a kind of... It went into a cough, I right? said this poem backwards to it so many times, it went into a kind of stupor like that, and then it yawned, it yawned, and a tortoise yawning is all encompassing, all encompassing. <laughs> so this is the first time you've had form dust in together, um, in terms of working together, but... You know, I, I, I saw, it was Mrs. Brown, I, mean, I saw Judy and Mrs. Brown um, in the States, and I was so... Taken with the performance that I and I rarely do this. I said it's possible to get her phone number, and I got her phone number and I called her and I started going on and on and on about you know how brilliant I thought she was in the film and she keeps trying to interrupt me. I keep going past the interruption and finally she said, "I really have to be on stage now." <laughs> <laughs> it's between the first and second act. She called her cell phone. What play was it? Do you remember? She was on the West End, so... Fantastic. <laughs> 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 and you actually own a tortoise, that much I do know. Yes, I do. Uh, uh, I had... I had another one. I had two. One... They, 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 they can actually be careful because they'll go underneath the fence. And he made his way out to uh, traffic and got run over. And oh. still lived, and we had it put down. And until you had to put down a tortoise, it's, it's not, it, was, it was sad. But then the other one has survived. His name is Seventy, uh, because I got it on my 70th birthday, <laughs> so about 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I do have. You do have a tortoise. We should stress that no tortoises, um, that age-old gag, were harmed in the filming of uh, Roald Dahl. No, no, we, we, wanted, to put, we right. wanted to put on the credits no tortoises were harmed in the filming of this. Except by do Judy Dench. Finally, we've got what he said. Finally, they turn on you, Judy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about you, Deborah, as the director? The perils of well, for a stop. How many tortoises were there? Uh, there were um, uh, sixty live ones and forty models, and then a few. Um, uh, a few reproduced ones. We had an animatronic one. We had every version of tortoise. I even had wore a wore a tortoise <coughs> as, a, as a good luck charm. And um, the makeup, uh, uh, the costume lady gave all the ladies uh, uh, good luck charms of tortoises. So um, uh, Dustin and Judy were so easy, and the tortoises were just they had such demands. They just needed to rest. Dustin and Judy turned up on set at eight in the morning and worked without without break, through meal breaks, the whole, uh, whole lot, never any demands, just would do it again and again, and tortoises had to have their breaks, had to be brought down. Well, are there strict <laughs> rules for tortoises like there are children? Yeah. There, they have to be accompanied. They have to be accompanied. <laughs> there was, we had a tortoise around there, an absolutely wonderful guy called Mark, who just was... was you, have, you have to tell, you talk to him, was he married or something, you had a conversation? Oh God, I went out to him one day to look at, because when when we went around all the various pet shops uh, looking for the locations, they, they, they weren't as I imagined in, you know, from my childhood and my experience of being in pet shops. And of course, health and safety now means no animals can be kept in the windows of pet shops as we remember and growing up. So uh, um, we went, uh, Mark ran an exotic uh, uh, pet shop just outside London. So I went out to him one day and oh my God, there were exotic um, animals just all through the pet shop, all he brought me around to his house, his back garden had the owl from Harry Potter, there were tortoises the size of this table, there were, um, I mean there were ferrets, there were, then he took me through his house and I said to him, Mark, are you married? And he said, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Jill said, 
by Joseph uh, because of a tortoise. <coughs> There's something about um, uh, Mrs. Silver that, again, as I said, to use that phrase, you, it, it, you just light up when you see it, and particularly the costumes as well. Did you have a hand in that, Judy? Yes, I loved, I loved all that. Very unlike me, which is heaven, you know. It's not so much fun looking like yourself. And I felt in that red wig, and I felt in all those costumes, I did feel like Mrs. Silver, not like me. What a relief. <laughs> and so that was... And then I was offered this... I was just saying, yes, I was offered one of these dresses, that white flowery dress, um, and they said, would you ever wear it? I said, well, of course I'll wear it. Well, of course, it hangs in my cupboard, and I looked at it, and I think, when am I ever going to wear it? <laughs> <laughs> what is it I possibly? Well, you know, not looking like this. Yes, if I got that kind of all red wig, and I was all anyhow like that, I might get a totally copy like that. There aren't many there aren't many people that can um, like she's dressed uh, at times like one of the long traps that she's wearing the curtains and she looks <laughs> absolutely remarkable. It uh, pulls it off like she's like moving uh, <laughs> It's um it's a truly positive piece, of course. I'm uh, very optimistic. Um, piece, which is why it's so heartwarming every time at this time of the year uh, as well. Um, Dustin, the dance moves I was particularly interested in. We're shuffling they around are, the floor. They are. They are. They are. They, yeah, we're on brand here, don't worry. They are. They're particularly. They are. They are. They look good. They, well, they I was taking lessons uh, from a choreographer, and I'm not a dancer. I'm nowhere near it. And I thought after the first two lessons, this is not going to work because we're supposed to shoot the last two days, I think, in. Uh, Batter City, uh, the full blown thing. I said, I'm not going to be ready, not even close, and, and you don't have anyone else to double me, uh, so you better get one. Uh, and then we had a lesson together, and uh, Dirk just became enchanted with the way we were just naturally doing it. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a problem because I wasn't supposed to know how to dance. And she'll dance your socks off this morning. <laughs> Is that a fact, Judy? Oh my God! <coughs> great energy and great energy. Energy. Yes. I have. <laughs> <laughs> Space. Touch wood. And the chemistry as well. Uh, Richard obviously hit the ground running. Oh yeah, it was it was such an exciting thing, and they were both unbelievably uh, sweet to work with, and very different kinds of of actors, and it was kind of extraordinarily frustrating in a way because for the first four weeks they weren't in a scene together were you that the construction of the way we made the film was very like the film because so judy was at one level and dustin was at the other level and they never got to be within a you know in the, almost in the not in the same shot except for one really wide shot for a month so for all of us those two the, the final scene was when she he comes down to her flat and she comes up to his were like they were happy for real. We've been so <coughs> longing to see. It was a bit like, you know, De Niro and Pacino who never appeared in the same shot in Heat. We were just longing just to prove that they'd both been there at the same time. And Dustin had four days when he was he was just with tortoises all day. <laughs> enough to send anyone slightly bonkers. I did prefer those over Judy though. <laughs> 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 Oh, but oh yeah, that that yes, you, you have never you 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 you've never smelled anything like sack <laughs> of tortoises until you that that tortoise poo with that that that, that, that that was the real that was the real thing. The are the deathly side seven in the one scene during the hall and stuff. I mean, they were all there. Right? They weren't sort of added later, but they, they no, were all they're, there. They're there. No CGI for us. Um, it was there was. I, well, actually, I was, I, it was good for me because I, as I was just said, I do have a tortoise and, and I learned that, uh, oh, I can't wait to get home and give it some strawberries because there was some <coughs> delicacies I didn't know that they, they were. That's a strawberry. I, I loved watching them eat. Uh, well, on, on that fragrant note, let's open it up to the floor. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you could declare yourself in the time of the of these uh, uh, Q&As. Um, and address uh, the team here. Um, Why show of hands. Filled up? 
Yeah, yeah. Come to the front, all of you. We're going to use CGI. The tortoise is full of tortoises. Alison James, James Magazine. I wanted to ask you, Judy, Mrs. Silver in the film, when the Christmas tree's up, she said, Oh, when you get old, if you can't break the rules, what's the point? Both of you, do you feel that way in your own life, do you think? Well, you can't break the rules when you get older. No, no, you can't break the rules when you're getting a bit older. When can you? You know, it's fun to break the rules of life, I suppose. Well, I think it's quite fun to break the rules at any time. I don't think it necessarily (laughs) matters that you're getting that dreaded word. We've always been like that from the beginning. So, I think it's good not to conform, actually. But I don't think it's good to do it... Um, I don't think consciously not conforming is not on, but I think that if you don't want to toe the line and you don't want to, you know, you want to break the rules, go ahead and do them. I think. One day I was, um, I I made the mistake (coughs) of saying to Judy that I thought she looked a bit more like the Quentin Blake drawing in the book than Dustin did, because it's very Arthur Lowe, the drawing. Judy took enormous offence to this <laughs> and pointed out that the woman had a pointy nose and didn't look anything like her. And the next day, she gave me a little gift. She said, here's a little present to you, Richard. And it was a uh, photocopy of a picture of her from the book, coloured in. And it just said, dear Richard, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's going to behave badly. That is a good point. This Quentin Blake for the show is obviously like, so synonymous with and so people are going to have their images, aren't they? They're very protectable. But I mean, I, I must admit, I wasn't aware of the book and, uh, until a couple of days ago when I was addressing this. But obviously, you're very passionate about it, Judy. So you must have had ideas, very fixed ideas about how the characters would have looked. Well, I, I know, I know, I didn't have any fixed ideas until I read read the script, and right. then you know, you try and fit into that, and, and hopefully, you do. And you did. It's great to Right. Another question, young man. Um, Mr. Hoffman, hello, um, I'm from the uh, BBC News website, my name's uh, Joel Smith. Um, watching you dance with Julia, I was reminding you of another time when you were dancing uh, on film uh, with Tom Cruise in uh, Rayman. I was wondering whether you made the same connection yourself, or whether you could, if there were any comparisons between them and Julia. And Tom Cruise. In the dancing and Tom Cruise. I'm not Sorry. <laughs> they smelled exactly the same. <laughs> I didn't don't think I, I thought of Tom once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, Judy, were you thinking of Tom at all at any point during filming? I never thought of him once. <laughs> <laughs> Good, we've popped that. No, it's like, but it's like that question of. You know, when I was at Stratford all those years, do it, I, and we'd, do four, we'd be doing four plays of Stratford, or five, and people would say, don't you get the plays muddled up? Well, you, you, you don't get them muddled up, because they're all different plays, so you've all got a different part, you've all tied a different costume. It, it's a different mindset, you know, for it all. And therefore, nothing really ever overlaps much, does it? Well, you just finished doing what before you started doing this year? Something, right? Marigold. Yes. And then after SEO, immediately you stayed there working for Mr. Weinstein. Yes. Uh, I did a tulip for yes. <laughs> And then I gave Half you an hour. a BAFTA in Los Angeles and you came out for one day because you had to get back to doing a Shakespeare. The Duchess of York. <laughs> <laughs> Take them while they're offered, I think. <laughs> 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 well, that bombshell, I haven't been thinking about Tom Cruise at all. I've thought about Tom for years. Um, <coughs> Ian Wiley, Freelance. Um, question for Judy and Dustin. Looking back, can you recall a role or roles where you really felt that you began to come out of your shell and really grow as actors? Come out of my shell? Yeah. You mean and not be at all like me? Well, just in your, your earlier career, it, it, when, it, when you, felt you really began to grow as an actor. Well, I don't know. I think you learn, learn from every single thing you do. And, uh, and I always like doing the most different thing from the last thing I've ever done. 
you know, uh, I love, 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 I love playing Cleopatra because people, uh, uh, people were openly kind of rude about me playing the part when they heard I was going to play. Um, so the challenge of that was absolutely tremendous. And then I, and then, you know, the, you play one thing. Now, the, the last thing now I would want to play is anybody like Mrs. Silver, the last thing. <coughs> um, and then suddenly getting a part like, like Barbara Cabot in, in Notes, uh, in, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Mr. Scandal. Scandal. Uh, you know, is a kind of gift, absolute gift. You think, oh, you know, another kind of stimulus, something else to get hold of, some other, other person kind of to, to find out about and try and portray. And so, I mean, I think every single th I've, I've never, I've never a actually, I've never done a part where I haven't learned something new in it, a new, you know, I'm, uh, and I remember my, uh, Michael Williams, my husband, and I did um, Diary of a Nobody, and we said, oh, this is going to be, so it's very short, and it's going to be in the theatre, it's very short, and um, <clears throat> we'll just do this, and then we'll go home, and it'll be absolutely wonderful, which is one of the hardest things I've ever, ever, ever done, ever done. And, you know, so things always present a challenge, I think, always. And the more challenge it presents, the better you feel. Dustin. And the more miserable you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may, the first thing I want to say, just listening to Judy, is that what makes Judy so extraordinary, I think, more extraordinary than other extraordinary actors, is this blend of character and herself, so that the character never, so-called character, never runs away from the actor, so that she blends herself, she's in there, every molecule of herself, so when you're watching this flamboyant, I think this is flamboyant, Mrs. Silver, and there she is sitting there showing uh, Alfie these photographs, uh, and she starts talking about her husband, Judy comes through there, and it's chilling. And you won't get, for my two bucks, you won't you won't get better acting than that. Where you see this 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 blend of you know what I mean? It's just it's it just gets you. She just allows you right into her uh, bone marrow, as it as it were. And you don't do that, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> All I tried to do was, uh, I just said to my wife, I said, because uh, it is true, and we've talked about it, that it's by hook or crook that you become successful <coughs> in this business. Uh, it's a freak accident, I always think, because we know the longer we live, so many talented actors that just weren't at that place at that time and just, you know, wind up uh, much less fortunate. And uh, and if if I so I start in this part. Well, what if that didn't happen to me? And it could very I could see myself. I guess that's what it comes down to. Can you see yourself alone? Can you see yourself just living alone? And I just I could see myself. I could see it right now. I mean, this has all been a dream anyway, right? <laughs> you always think you know. We like, imagine. Yeah, and you think I'm going to wake up with tubes coming out, and I'll say, you mean I really didn't become a star? I've really been unconscious for 50 years. <laughs> it, it was amazing, actually, because uh, Dustin would sometimes creep up and say, isn't she absolutely wonderful to work with? And then Judy would creep up a few minutes later and say, he is such a dream to work with. But I have no idea whether they told each other. <laughs> We didn't talk, we just fondled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think, just to say that it was a real life love story um, in the sense that um, I, as, I watched you fall in love uh, together. And, uh, you know, Dustin is a naturally very shy person, um, surprisingly. And, um, uh, and Judy is so naughty and has so much raw to be and has such a sense of fun. And uh, Dustin would turn around and say, God, isn't she brilliant, isn't she wonderful? We'd be up 30 feet in the air and Judy would be about 15 feet in the air and we'd run between upstairs and downstairs. And then when we rehearsed the dance, 
I mean, and that's where it was just, Dustin just stood there, rooted to the spot, and just watched Judy, watched Miss Hill. He, she, he said, there's no acting here. Isn't she just, you know, as she wove the spell um, around. So it was just such a, a real life, a real life love story, I think. It's a beautiful moment. Oh. Is that me? Oh, uh, Julian Newby from the British Film Commission. Could you talk a bit about the uh, logistics of the, of the shooting? Uh, the choice of the apartment block was, was fantastic to look at. And, uh, you know, I was constantly wondering, did you build a, a set so that the two things were, uh, one was above the other? How, how did you work that um, one apartment above the other situation? Well, we... Um we actually did build the apartment. We had a stage in Pinewood, which was fantastic because they're like gold dust at the moment. And um, we built on a rostra so that Mrs. Silver's flat was about 15 foot up. Yeah, yeah. And then Mr. Hoppers was up another 15. And we found a location, but obviously we had to find a location first. And we found a location in Hackney that we used. But the key thing that Dervla realised very early on was that in the book, you imagine the, the flats to be above each other. And that wouldn't work for the actors because they'd be... So you have to step them so they both had their own platforms to work on. Yeah, I mean, the, the most difficult part of this whole production, I think, uh, forget the tortoises, working with two extraordinary actors, Richard and Paul's script, the schedule, etc. I, I think the greatest challenge was the location. A, finding a location, because when you read it, when you read the script, you don't think about any of the technicalities of, of the script. It was one of the easiest, most enjoyable scripts to read. And then, of course, when you go out looking, because originally, initially you set out, you know, we always wanted to keep it truthful and, and, and ground it in a reality. Of course, there are, I can tell you, there are only two apartment blocks in the whole of London that actually are staggered apartments, because when we went <laughs> looking for them, um, uh, they just actually don't, don't exist. And Rodal wrote it, obviously with no idea that it would be adapted someday, because he certainly didn't make it easy. And I think he wrote it in the, in the pictures, although he stayed very much away from Quentin Crisps, um, or Quentin Blake's um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, illustrations. But it's set in a mansion uh, block, which is, is only three, four blocks, but by virtue of the adaptation of from, from Paul and Richard, we needed, it had to be at least um, six blocks high because of the storytelling of Mrs. Wu. And so um, finding that apartment block, and we found and lost oh, we a couple yes. of them. And yeah. then when we found it, because we always thought we'd shoot it for real, apartment uh, balconies by their very nature on the south side, south facing side of the building, which of course is no good because the light is on it all of the time. Um, you know, planes going overneath, and you know, we, we basically there isn't a crane high enough to shoot it, um, to shoot it for real. So we did, um, we did uh, build the apartment, and we built them for real. So they were on extraordinary scaffolding. So literally, Dustin and Judy couldn't, they could not communicate with each other except on the balconies. There was no kind of little slip hole that they could, um, you know, um, or that we could move easily between the two apartments. We did have one day, one whole day on location just to get some of the bigger, bigger views. Was that a challenge for the actors, the, the up and down bit of the... Uh, the challenge aspect? on your neck, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of looking up like that. <laughs> the hardest part is I, I always get warm. So I always want air conditioning. And I can say, but they have air conditioning. Oh, fine, well, they must have it. And they have, they brought in a great big, you know, they didn't have it. And, and uh, the guys brought in these quick big machines because it really was humid, it was hard to keep your energy. And then suddenly by the third day, we're not using them anymore. And it, it, it took a long time for me to find out the real reason, and it was because of the tortoises. <laughs> <laughs> the tortoises, <laughs> if they get too cold, they won't act. <laughs> 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 Next question, gentlemen in the middle of Hi, Simon Patton, so from uh, The Guardian and uh, the Radio Times. Uh, I was just wondering, Dustin, it, uh, weirdly, it reminded me of, um, you reminded me of Benjamin in The Graduate, almost 50 years on. And there were similarities in the story, almost losing the woman and the dissidents. 
And I wondered if you had thought of Benjamin at all when you were making him. It almost seems like a, a, a revisit in some way. And uh, my second question, I might be wrong, is, but why isn't this getting a cinema release? Um, well, well, the second one is it just was never intended for that purpose. I mean, right great in the cinema. Cinema and then telly, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get back to him. Harvey will get it. I don't think he will, but... Um, <clears throat> she's been my rip, Mrs. Robinson since I... <laughs> <laughs> Wrong about this, though. isn't she? Wasn't she much older? In, in real life, I was 29 going on 30 when I did it, and, and Bancroft was 35, which is only five years difference. And here, I'm much older than <laughs> but no, I didn't, I didn't think of it consciously, but yeah, I, I, mean, it's, uh, I thought it was the closest character I've seen to you playing that. Really, yeah, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Just <laughs> that is the weird film, but thing about film and the things that you've done, isn't it? That you're often the person who's watched it least. I wonder if an occasion ever happens when Dustin would sit down and watch The Graduate. Yeah, I've watched it, you know, with various children three times in the last ten years. It's an odd. Yes, I talked to Dustin about all, about all the president's men. And Dustin couldn't remember how it ended. <laughs> <laughs> badly for Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Say another question. <coughs> Catherine has some free last. Um, to Judy and, and Dustin, what surprised you most about working with each other finally? <laughs> what surprise? Yeah. Or did you like most? Oh, I, what I liked about it was boasting that I was going to do it <laughs> before we started. And, then, and now I say, oh, I know him. Oh, I know him. Um, was there a lot of jealousy that you were going to work with? Well, other people being yeah, jealous. Yeah. Oh, I think, oh, I think so. <laughs> yes, why not? I want to do a movie. I don't want to play film with these guys, but I want to do a movie with, uh, with all of CGI's and stuff that can happen today. We could, I, because I started looking at all Judy's stuff uh, when I realized I was going to get to work with her. And extraordinary Google thing. I mean, my God, just push, it's, you know. And there's Judy, you know, in her teenage years, in her 20s, and, and equally gorgeous now, but I mean, stunning. And I, and I said to Judy, I said, if I met you, then I wouldn't have let you get away. <laughs> and I must say, there must be a way to, to do a love story where, where we meet in our 20s, but yet we're acting as we are now. We must, does, does that make any sense at all? It's just computer graphics or something. It's just CGI. Why can't we look like we did in our 20s? <laughs> if only we could do if only. Where's your title? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a bad if only. If only, absolutely. I mean, she, what a scrumptious looking woman right from the beginning throughout her life. She is. That, that's, I don't lie about these things because I hate it. Everybody else ever wore it. In the in the Western Hemisphere, of course. It's a lovely moment, by the way, because uh, Richard Cordry is in here. Such a gorgeous performance, and the sense of history with <laughs> actors who you've known a long time. There was an incredibly touching moment at our first uh, lunch together, I think, when Richard said the first show he'd ever seen in the theatre in London was you in uh, Cabaret, and that that was the thing which made him want to become oh, I didn't know that. an actor. Yeah. He's wonderful. He's a good actor. Lovely, yeah. 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 Let's take some more questions while we've got time. Let's go on out. Let's go back to the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a story about hope and love in old age and in Mrs. Silver's case in widowhood. What was the appeal of telling that story to you, to you, Dustin Richards? The appeal of telling the story of love in widowhood. Or old age. Or old Older age. age. Sorry. Older age, up to you both. You know, um, from the moment I got this part and I was in London, I 
I just started cutting out all these newspaper things, you know, get a bunch of newspapers in the morning, a lot of trash, the, 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 the amount of trash in newspapers you have. We used to have them in New York, not anymore. Uh, the Star, the Sun, the, I mean, you just, so much fun. Uh, and, you know, all these, I just, uh, I was looking at my bulletin board, uh, I got here two days ago, and I just clipped this one out and put it in my book. Woman 105 had to wait six hours for the ambulances to come and pick her up. Uh, and and did, and, you know, she had injured herself or something, and they picked it up, and she's fine. But another woman, you know, someone else in their 90s, someone else 102. It, uh, it's, it's another time now, and so it's, I don't think of it, it's hard to answer your question, because you said old age, and then you said older age, and now I'm not even sure older age works. I mean, there's this guy, Manuel Oliviera, who just finished directing his last film. He's like this, you know, legendary director of Portugal. He's 105. So I know this doesn't occur to someone as young as you, but we're in a rich community right now. So, you know, when we eventually do die, we won't know it probably for about five years. <laughs> <laughs> Do you take the same question? Well, well, I just, I just think that age is age is a number, and it's something that is something it's, it's imposed on you. It's imposed on you. People that I, the only time I really got upset was when I was forty for some reason. I got really upset when I was forty, but after that, uh, I, I think it's only it's well, it's that old old thing that everybody says. It's as, you're as old as you feel. And uh, the only thing is, it drives me absolutely spare when people say, are you going to retire, or uh, don't you think it's time to reach your feet up, or tell me my age. But people like to tell you your age. They love it. They love it. And I love it. Uh, and I don't, want to, I don't want to be told that I'm too old to do something. I want to try first, and then, if I don't succeed, then I can be told I can't do it. You know, so it's the presumption. Otherwise, yes. You know, because you get to a certain age, then, oh, well, you mustn't do that, or you might have a fall, or you might, um, you know, you, you can't learn the lines, or you can't see. You know, let me have a go. Let us all have a go. Yes. Because, you know, if the real cross-section of people say in this room, I, mean, I, can't, I can't see, so I can't see anybody's faces. So, but if there was a cross-section, of people um, saying, or all of the same age, say, what, what we say, 39 or 40, everybody would be totally different. Everybody's energy would be different. Everybody's outlook would be different. And it's not to do with age. It's something to do with inside. It's, 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 uh, it's the engine. As long as you can keep the engine going for a bit, and you won't from fall my, over. Yeah, I mean, and from my point of view, I just suddenly thought, because love was a huge, you know, thing with my mum and dad, but I suddenly thought, I've been writing all these films about people who are in a position where if it doesn't work out, then they'll be just, you know, they could, if it doesn't work out with Julia Roberts, you can go around the corner and Kate Hudson will be there. But uh, I, I think that the idea of how important it would be if you were lonely when you were older, it actually makes the stakes higher and the rewards more extraordinary. And I, and I, I did feel that trying to write about two people falling in love and finding love when they both have presumed that they wouldn't ever, rather than a hopeful and presuming that they will, would make it actually even more dramatic. And I, I, I think that of the films I've written which have got love in them, these are the, this is the finished couple that I believe most likely to stay together. There's a line that Bertrand Russell, I have written down on my whiteboard as well, not by good Bogan for when he turned 90 they asked him how it felt and this is how many years ago did he turn 90 my god they said how does it feel to be 90 and he says oh to be 80 again <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen there you've been very patient with us good judy judy it's not often we um, see your cleavage now <laughs> yeah not often we see it often did you enjoy Oh yeah, oh I've shown my cleavage for, for 60 years nearly. <laughs> <laughs> Is that so? Is it very low? Well it's well, because you're looking from above. <laughs> <laughs> That's rude. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
sexually forward character than maybe you have. Well, that's her, years. isn't it? You know, she, she, you know, she gets on with what she's got and makes the best of it. <laughs> You're <laughs> <laughs> thinking about Paul Newman now, or Carrie Grant. Now I've gone back. No. <laughs> yeah, I've gone back. Ooh, <laughs> steady yourself, Judy. Steady yourself. <laughs> um, this film uses some effects to help with the tortoises, but in the service of the story. Do you think in films today, too often, the special effects and the CGI gets to overwhelm the story, and it's maybe it's gone too far? To both leads. You say. I mean, cynically, people have been starting to say, or have been saying, that it's over. You know, the movie is as we know it. It's just over. It's just it's not the same. I remember in the 80s, uh, the 80s, I, I was promoting Tootsie in Italy, and I got to meet Fellini at dinner, and he was saying then how there's no fun anymore. He says, he was speaking. You know, I make movies, moving houses used to be cathedrals. You walk up these stairs and there's, you know, chandeliers and big screen. And he says, you were, felt like you were in a palace. Now he says, it's all in a mall and people come in on their roller skates and they sit down and it's, it's very small. Well, and look at, here it is 30 years later or something. And, you know, you it's being watched on an eye or some guy sitting in the car and we were, my wife and I walked, walked down the street. We were walking down the street last night, Ken High Street, and there's a guy just sitting in a car watching it next to Spectre, and next to us, and I said, what? He, he says, that's actually on trot. Pretty soon, he'll just be watching it by himself in the car. But then I saw, I saw Interstellar in the IMAX, and of course that was absolutely amazing. I, I think it will reinvent itself. My, that's my little 12-year-old is so amazing, the access he's got to the to the history of cinema now. You know, for his birthday he got a fifty pound voucher, he went to Video City and we bought four classic films, one from each decade, and I couldn't do that when I was young. I saw, you know, I saw Zulu once. <laughs> and then I didn't see it again for thirty years and I had to be in that Sunday. So I think there are and I think the the rise of the way that actors like Dustin and Judy are, are happy to do something like this for the telly. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's so wonderful that however uh, many million people will <coughs> definitely watch it on, on on the day that it goes out. If, if we're lucky, you know, I think there are uh, things things change. I remember Paul Schrader once being asked about movies, it, 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 sort of the same thing, and and he said, you know, you go with what happens. He said, Mandragals were once hugely popular. <laughs> <laughs> and they faded away and suddenly, you know, pop music replaced them. So I'm hopeful that what, what, as things go up, as things go down, things will go up. Absolutely. Okay. Any idea there? Hi, I'm Moya from Good Housekeeping magazine. Um, in the film, Mr. Hockey says, Mr. Hockey talks about taking the most of unhappy childhood. That's why I disputed uh, to myself, Richard, at the very beginning, saying he had wonderful parents or a happy childhood. And I said, he's lying. I said, he'd be the first person, really creative person I've ever met who came from a happy childhood. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's just, uh, you know, charitable. Uh, I just think that the more creative you are, the more complicated your, your childhood not uh, not reaching five foot six and not anything more has changed my life. <laughs> I kept saying, when's the next? And, you know, when am I going to get any taller? Uh, uh, well, certainly the, the graduate, because uh, I expected just to, you know, to Bob DeVell, Hackman, and I would just hope to be character actors, which meant the people supporting the leads, you know, so there's a kind of freak accident for all, but it was, uh, this is not a consequence, but, uh, uh, 
getting divorced from my first wife changed my life, uh, and meeting my second and, and, and current wife, having the children uh, changes your life. But I think more than anything else, uh, um, waking up and realize, and it is a wake up, waking up and realizing that you have not been living your life, and Richard and I talked about this, because when you're in a creative, doing the creative dance, it, it's all encompassing, especially when you're in those years, you know, 30s, 40s, and suddenly just putting a, a, a break on it and saying, you know, my work is, is just, it, it should be just my work, it should not be my life. That's huge, and I think you can probably say it better. That's sort of what my, the, the film about time was about. That's right. right. Yeah. To do that. But I have to say, this was a this was a fun film to make, wasn't it? We did have good fun. Quite a hard good work, time. not very hard work for Derva, mm -hmm. who the unbelievably hard work for Derva, who had to run between both sets up and down the stairs. Mm -hmm. How many days did we shoot? Five weeks, five and a half weeks. Thirty days. I have to say this was a, a key moment for me because um, Richard invited me to work with him on SEO Top uh, three months after I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, and so I had that sense of you know, wondering where my life is going to go. And then I had the most extraordinarily happy, fulfilling experience of my life working on this film, and it sustained me over the last three years. And actually, the whole purpose of the story really is to show that it's never too late. And whatever happens to you, never give up and never. You know. I just thought we'd get you cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised. Well, it's all, all, all cost. <laughs> but I'd give Judy a couple of key moments if it's at all possible to distill it. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, well, I, well, I suppose a key moment was. I, I, trained as a theatre designer uh, and, and and I went to Stratford uh, and I saw a production of King Lear with Michael Redgrave and uh, oh way back in the 50s and I knew that night I just knew that I wasn't, wasn't going to be a designer uh, that I thought I will never think it was an enormous stage that looked like a it looked like a poppadom it was a huge circular rough thing and it turned everywhere and became the cave, the throne, every single thing. You know, and I only understood curtains coming down and change the set, curtains going up. That's all I had really understood. And suddenly I thought, oh, this is what, this is what designing is. And I thought, I don't have that imagination. And so it wasn't like St. Paul on the way to Damascus. It was a, a, a it was one of those moments. And then, and then, and then I suppose get, getting, getting, going to Central and getting into the Old Vic. I left Central and went straight to the Old Vic and played Ophelia and got shot down at a thousand feet. But I, but they went on employing me, which was very good. <laughs> Just, and, I, and, and that was my kind of real passion with Shakespeare. And so I was there from 57 to 60. I didn't mean to make such a long speech, 61. <laughs> and so I got to do the things I absolutely were passionate about. And then I went to Stratford. So, I, you know, I got a real dose of it, and then... Uh, so someone said to you, I was able to give uh, <coughs> Judy her basket in Los Angeles, and I never knew when you made your speech, that someone looked at you at the very beginning and said, you'll never be in the movie. That's right, they did. They did. They said they did. It was an it. office in Piccadilly, I always remember it. I'm not going to tell you who it was. But, um, yes, yes they, I'm sorry, but he said, you, you will never make a film. Because he said your face is a kind of wrong arrangement. He said so. <laughs> <laughs> and he said for 32 years he was. And then and then and then it was 32 years later. I went back to up to New York to do the press for Mrs. Brown. Yes. Fantastic. So, you know, so many key things. I mean, wonderful, so, wonderful yeah. things and terrible things too. Oh, thanks, uh, Neil. And just you know, Judy, you obviously enjoyed each other's company very much. I just wondered, did you make the effort and make time to go out for dinners together? Did you get to know each other socially? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I, 
I mean, Judy always wanted to, but I needed a nap. Julia always knew what we knew the next day. Yeah, when we were working. I, I don't socialize when I'm working. I don't socialize when I'm not working. <laughs> grandmother in the background smoking a fag and then his so we um you know muffin there are other beautiful pictures and we got a, a, a picture of judy as you do and this was splendid and i remember on the day in the scene giving judy the, the album for the and she went that's awfully like me <laughs> it's it's you it's, it couldn't be me that's not my husband <laughs> I know we mocked it up and uh, so it's so like me, I can't. So it was extraordinary, the magic of cinema. But Judy was totally, and I think we had a moment with it because it was her and not her husband. It was like, <laughs> and the taller man. And um, and I remember you were quite um, concerned. Well, I felt ra rather bad that I didn't remember the man who was <laughs> <laughs> Not the brightest bulb in the shadow there, I think, is the light, isn't it? Uh, and her only comment was that she hasn't got quite enough cleavage, but it was your face, but there's no cleavage. <laughs> one more uh, question. I've, I've, have I ignored anybody? I'm, I'm feeling very conscious about this. Okay, the, all right, turn on the list. Hi, I'm Phil from Wild Two Four Seven. My question's for uh, uh, Judy and Justin. Um, I grew up on Bull Donald books, absolutely adore them. And I know Judy has a, a history with SEO Trot, you know, credit to the and grandchildren. I was just wondering, uh, what do you guys think of Roald Dahl as an author? What does he mean to you as his wife? You know, what do you each actually get to do in his uh, works for a film? You know, bring this back on point and back to Roald Dahl. What does Roald mean, Dahl mean to you in his other story? You know, when did he start writing children's stories? Because I was already an adult, I think, so. Uh, I was a kid. I chance to go down and sit in that little little hut he used to sit in, to write in. Um, one day, uh, before we, long before we did this, years, several years ago. Uh, that was very exciting. And I mean, I've just read, you know, the BFG, all, all those, all those stories, children's stories. <coughs> I mean, The Witch has got to be the best book to read to children. Children cannot believe how cruel <laughs> that book is and how frightening it is. I don't think anyone's ever read that book to their child and then the next six months hasn't been haunted by looking at people's <laughs> shoes and being suspicious every time you go into a, into a sweet shop. There is a peculiar magic, I think, to, to this work. Dustin? Um, as I said, I never read him when I, certainly when I was a kid. Uh, no one read stories to me. I read um, stories to my kids, and certainly The Giant Peach was a, was a favorite. Uh, but I certainly didn't read them all. Uh, I was probably working more often than uh, when I should have been reading kids' uh, stories. If, uh, you know, you get home from work and just say one thing that was not asked is that Durbra was so well organized and so giving as a director that I've never seen anyone, you know, more disciplined in when you show up and she knows what she wants to do and everything and you, you just you felt you felt very comfortable in her hands and it's nice to thank her publicly. And to also thank these writers because they are first rate and uh, I have a history of 
producers and by far <laughs> the sweetest, wonderful woman you will ever want to work for. Probably why she's not more successful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys, thank you very much indeed.